Welcome to this seminar on human security, its importance, challenges, and the case of Japan. As uh, Ebba just said, my, my name is Torbjörn Rodén, and I'm the head of ISDP's China Center. I've been asked to moderate this webinar, which is the first in a series of discussions about human security that Ambassador Lars Varje, uh, who is the head of our Japan Center, has initiated. Later this autumn, there will be one webinar, webinar about East Asia and human security, and also one about conclusions that can be drawn from the first two webinars. I also think we have good reason to hope that these webinars will be the beginning of a research project on human security. We have four speakers or panelists today, and the first speaker is Lars Varje. Lars, who is not only the head of ISDPS Japan Center, but also a leading specialist in Sweden on Japan, its history, culture, and society. Our second speaker will be Mrs. Jad Jonsson Leysen. She is now the editor in chief of the journal Mens Klygsäkerhet, which in English is Human Security, which publishes two articles every week on human security. Jad also has a long career behind her, working for the Swedish Foreign Ministry and also for the UNHCR and the World Bank. Our third speaker will be Dr. Paul Jonsson, who is a member of the Swedish Parliament representing the Moderate Party. <clears throat> uh, Paul has a PhD from King's College in London, where he wrote his dissertation about human security politics at the Department of War Studies. As a politician, Paul's major interest is also security and defense. He is his party's spokesman when it comes to security and defense policy, and he holds the important position uh, of chair at, of the Defense Committee in the Swedish Parliament. He is also the chair of the Swedish Japanese Parliamentarians Group. Our fourth and final speaker will be Dr. Marie Höjlund Rösgård from Copenhagen. She is Associate Professor of Modern Japanese Studies at the Department of Cross-Cultural and Regional Studies at the University of Copenhagen. Academically, she is a specialist on Japanese education and modern Japanese society. But her knowledge uh, of Japan is not only based on book reading. She grew up in Japan, where she has spent many years. And so her combination of theoretical knowledge and personal experience makes her eminently qualified to discuss the meaning and significance of human security in Japan. Now, each speaker will first speak for a maximum of 15 minutes. And then after that, we will open up for questions. Finally, each panelist will have uh, two minutes at the most to um, round up, up this webinar. And with, with these words, I now give uh, the word to Lars Varje, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to participate in this webinar. I, my uh, intention is to uh, begin by um, going through a, a couple of definitions that have been um, discussed uh, when it comes to uh, human security. Uh, if, just recently, um, just a few hours ago, the presidential debate uh, uh, in the United States uh, finished and uh, there's several aspects of that debate and, and the background to that debate that really is relevant to the discussion of human security. Um, even uh, the fr freedom of, of bullying and, and, and respecting the other party and, or the other person is really part of the um, human security. Uh, and it, it seems that this is the apex or this is a development of, of um, Inter, uh, were relations between human beings and, and nations and states that have gone on since the end of the World War II. It's a development that is not in, in all aspects is not perhaps heading in the right direction, but it's, it's a development that must uh, be discussed. Uh, after the Second World War, the, the um, national security concept uh, or was, was a dominant um, uh, definition of, of human security. Um, national uh, security was the same as, as human security, to put it 
in a, in a simple uh, description. Um, it, it, it later during the um, uh, development that, that followed, uh, more and more incidents and more and more developments showed uh, that uh, we also have to look at the human beings and the human being uh, and uh, the, the uh, human rights and, 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 and so forth. And looking at Japan, Japan at the end of the Second World War was uh, completely uh, destroyed physically and, and mentally and, and, and politically. And uh, many uh, worried, uh, not least the allied authorities that, that occupied uh, Japan, what direction Japan should take uh, after uh, uh, having gone through this horrible experience uh, during the first half of, this, of the uh, 20th century. And the con constitution was uh, more or less imposed on Japan, but Japan accepted the constitution and uh, accepted also the terms uh, of the, the, the um, occupation, the constitution and, and the defeat in the Second World War. No one really knew what would happen, but, but there were certain uh, things that, that um, uh, were put in place so that Japan would develop uh, in the way that, that people at that time wanted Japan to develop. And looking back, one can say that Japan did exactly what everybody wanted at that time. It, did, it developed into a democratic state, a democratic country, it was a bit hesitant when it came to uh, rearming, or actually it didn't rearm, but, but, it, but it got itself a, a self-defense force. Uh, and it emphasized human security in its, uh, in its policies, not least in its foreign policy. So I will go through a few definitions. Uh, of course, the first one that really is significant is uh, the ones that, that uh, U, uh, UNDP uh, published in the Human Development Report in 1994. And there were two or a couple of, of components uh, in their definition. And one was freedom of fear, that is of war or of abuse or, or, or whatever. The other was freedom of want, meaning you, should have, you, you shouldn't have to worry about education, about uh, wanting food. You, you shouldn't worry about uh, being provided opportunities to have food. Uh, you shouldn't worry about healthcare and so forth and so on. And uh, also since 2005, uh, part of that definition has been freedom to live in dignity. So it's really a very wide concept. Uh, all the way from, from uh, freedom from, from being hungry, also to be uh, uh, treated uh, with dignity. And later on, uh, I think the more and more stress has been on uh, the, the so-called soft aspects of human security, while, as we all know, there have been some developments in the military field all over the world that uh, point in, an, in another direction. There are also uh, examples uh, of, of nations where the human security is abused uh, in front of our very eyes, for instance, in Belarus. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, if one should sum up the, the definition of the uh, UNDP, uh, it would be uh, that they stress seven areas or seven points that, that should be included in the human security concept. Economic security is one, food security, health security, environmental security, personal security, community security, and political security. And my point uh, is really that you cannot stress one uh, of these aspects uh, and then forget about the others. You cannot miss any of the aspects. Uh, if you're mi missing something of it, then it's not a full uh, human security. 
also looking at the, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, num uh, the resolution number 66 slash 290. Uh, it says in 2012, human security is an approach to assist member states in identifying and addressing widespread and cross-cutting challenges to the survival, livelihood, and dignity of their people. And then you had the Commission on Human Security, which was founded in 2000 uh, on the initiative by Japan uh, and, uh, and Kofi Annan. And from its final report in 2003, uh, one can quote the following, to, to protect the vital core of all human lives in ways that enhance human freedoms and human fulfillment. Human security means protecting fundamental freedoms, freedoms that are the essence of life. It means protecting people from critical and pervasive threats and situations. It means using processes that build on people's strengths and aspirations. It means creating political, social, environmental, economic, military, and cultural systems that together give people the building blocks of survival and livelihood and dignity. And then you have the, the, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Japan, who builds on these definitions. And in August 2020, just recently, uh, had the following definition. Human security aims to protect people from critical and pervasive threats to human lives, livelihoods and dignity and to enhance human fulfillment. For these objectives, human security tries to integrate and strengthen the initiatives that emphasize human-centered perspectives. And there was an, an official of, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who also said, more or less at the same time, human security may be defined as the preservation and protection of the life and dignity of individual human beings. Japan holds the view as do many other countries, that human security can be uh, ensured only when the individual is confident of a life free of fear and free of want. Free of fear and free of want. So there are a number of definitions, uh, a number of words, uh, of course, but one has to put uh, meat behind <clears throat> those words. But one can say that, that there are those who emphasize the freedom of fear aspect and others that emphasize the freedom of want. One example uh, is uh, the, the, if you compare, for instance, Japan and China. Japan, if you look at all these um, uh, definitions within the uh, UNDP, Human Development Report, economic security, food security, health security, environmental security, personal security, community security, political security. Japan ticks off all of them. Sweden will also tick off uh, all of these. But if you look at China, economic security, yes, uh, you can say that, that people have economic security and China has, has impressively lifted uh, hundreds of millions of people out of uh, poverty. Food security, yes. Health security, probably. Uh, environmental security, more or less. They have had some, some environmental problems, but they're dealing with it. Personal security, to a certain point. Community security and political security, perhaps not. Uh, or at least not political security. So my point here is that if you don't cover the whole spectrum of the various aspects and, and, and tries to point out how you have been successful in one of the aspects, for instance, in China's case, the economic security and, 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 uh, and uh, the livelihood of, of people. And in order to cover that you're not living up to the other uh, as aspects, then it becomes uh, rather dangerous. So it, it's, it's everything or, or nothing in a way. And it, therefore it's very important to, to keep stressing uh, 
the whole package, uh, all of it. Kofi Annan also said in 2003, human security can no longer be understood in purely military terms. Rather, it must encompass economic development, social justice, environmental protection, democratization, disarmament, and respect for human rights and the rule of law. Moreover, these pillars are interrelated. Progress in one area generates progress in another. You could also say it the other way around. Lack of progress in one area uh, generates lack of progress in another. Uh, and finally, I think the, if one quotes the Pakistani economist and international development theorist, Mahbub ul Haq, I'm, I'm not sure about the pronunciation there. Human security is not a concern with weapons. It is a concern with human dignity. In the last analysis, it is a child who did not die, a disease that did not spread, an ethnic tension that did not explode, a dissident who was not silenced, a human spirit that was not crushed. I, I will end there by, by just stressing, uh, probably we'll come back to it if we comment on each other, that uh, it is sometimes uh, hard to define what is most important, but it is definitely important to stress that everything has to be included, otherwise human security as a concept has failed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars, for a presentation that I think was both illuminating and very interesting. You clarified the meaning of the concept of human security with which I think many of us who are interested still don't know very much about, or at least I'm one of them. And you also, in your presentation, I think you also raised a number of interesting points that we can return to in the later Q&A session and discussion. Now it's my, my honor to, to yield the floor to uh, Mrs. Yad uh, Jonsson Nathan, please. So, uh, so, good morning, everyone, and thanks very much to my uh, former colleague, Lars Weiner, for his very interesting uh, introduction and his. Uh, presentation of uh, various definitions of human security. I will also start by discussing what I regard as four different dimensions of human security, and then uh, go into the threats we perceive today. I would consider it wise to uh, indicate that uh, the first dimension of the human security is the one provided by states. And that provision can both be through military means, but certainly also with the diplomatic means. It is often stated that uh, diplomacy is the first line of defense. And uh, that dimension seems to be quite forgotten today, so I think we need to come back to that. State security is also a matter of ensuring police and uh, rule of law to protect citizens, and mainly citizens and not other people living within the borders of the country. Uh, however, we all know from history that uh, both police and military can also be used against a nation's own population. We've seen it in the case of Vienna at the time of the Napoleon Wars, when uh, uh, police uh, was very fierce. And of course, we have seen it 
in the Soviet Union, in China, and we see it very evidently today in Belarus. So, and I would also like to uh, point at another problem with the state provision of security. Having a, a significant or even huge military apparatus like in the United States, the biggest one, uh, may not in a sense be a means to ensure security or human security for people uh, within a nation border and uh, outside the border. Actually, uh, putting a lot of funding into military means can actually imply that you have less resources to address the aspects of military of the human security addressed by law, such as freedom from war. So I will now turn to very briefly to the second dimension of the human security freedom of war. I will just uh, point at that uh, dimension very briefly as Lars has uh, gone through the country. Anyway, uh, we should remember that in the 1990s, given the threat of the military tensions between the superpowers and the fall of the Berlin War, made it possible to look more into uh, the want aspects of human security. I think that we should recall that at that time there was a, a strong discussion on uh, the peace dividend. The fact that one could use funds uh, previously allocated to uh, military means and instead use them for human development for schools or food or the roof of the head of both people. So I think uh, uh, when we looked at the C3 uh, statistics in those days, we could see a fall in uh, expenditure on uh, art, and we could see a growing interest in uh, putting more money into uh, development. One uh, concrete example of that may be the former Minister of Defense, Matamara, who actually became uh, the president of the World Bank, a bank where I spent some years uh, in the 1980s. Now let me turn to the third dimension of uh, uh, of the human security, and that is the uh, individual rights agenda. Again, uh, it goes back and is reinforced in the 1990s after the Berlin War fall and uh, also uh, the fall of the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa. So there was a quest for human rights, for women's rights, and for freedom of media, and freedom of press, freedom of expression, independent uh, court, and uh, rule of law. So all in all, uh, I think that uh, uh, quest for individual rights is a very important dimension of you know, it also, of course, includes the right not to be discriminated on the grounds of sex, on the grounds of religion, ethnicity, etc. Now, I will turn to uh, the fourth dimension of human security. That's the one we're facing now uh, for the, during the last decade. And I will say that now we are facing both the old threat to human security, but also a number of new threats, which uh, makes the situation more critical. 
så vi stille har vi det former trends with the talk about the state security the lack of the uh, food and the roof from the head the lack of the respect for uh, uh, rule of law etc now we also have a number of threats facing humans as a collective and i would say that the climate uh, and global warming is by far the worst uh, we see that that um, uh, i would come back to that anyway we also have uh, pandemics of course we have the covid 19 which this morning i saw that we have the past one million deaths globally on that but there are also a number of um, other pandemics i would say violence against women is what many uh, consider a pandemic as it uh, uh, causes uh, as one out of every three women are affected by that violence which often is a deadly violence uh, we also have threats like the antibiotic resistance which i think is uh, a by far under to the human security. And of course, we still have the uh, collective threat in terms of nuclear war. And I would say that those threats have been aggravated uh, in the last 10 years and maybe in the last four years due to uh, lack of willingness to trust the uh, multilateral system and dialogue and diplomacy. So that in itself is a major threat. I would also like to mention two other threats that uh, maybe have become much worse since uh, uh, the report Lars had to mention from 2003. It's the role of media. I would say that media uh, has, in many countries, turned out to be uh, a threat to uh, democracy. We see it in states where the media is captured by state interests. Unfortunately, in countries like Poland and Hungary, but we see also heavy attacks of media and what we have been used to consider, to consider the major democratic force in the world, that is the United States, and attacks by the president himself. On the other hand, I would also say that media, when it is critical, when it is at its best, it's also the best we have in the defense of human security. Another threat that's come up during the last 10 years only is, of course, uh, uh, Facebook, Google, and the possibility to manipulate voters and voters' opinions in social media. I saw a very interesting article in the uh, Swedish news magazine from Dagens Industri. Uh, daily industry uh, indicating that we are we tend to be naive when we don't see what Facebook and social media is doing in uh, far more than political parties changing the uh, or trying to influence our political opinion. Uh, I will now turn from the different dimensions on human security to just briefly say that if we must remember that different groups uh, perceive human security as very different things. Most of us sitting in this panel would uh, feel quite personally secure. We have proof, we have proof from the head. We have the possibility to influence the political agenda. 
We don't fear police or military storming into our houses. But of course, the human security is something totally different for women or teenager child who lives in a violent uh, military conflict or in a violent household or belongs to a minority group or a sexual minority, ethnic minority or religious one. And uh, I haven't really had the time yet that I would read a new study of the Swedish Defense Academy pointing at the fact that women and men have quite different opinions on what security means and how it should be tackled. But we hope to uh, come back to the article in uh, our news magazine on that very Now, uh, let me uh, wind up here and say that I think today uh, all the threats that I've been uh, mentioning and uh, Lars mentioned earlier, I think are still relevant and need to be addressed. But I would like to stress that it's a bit scary that only in the last 10 years we have seen the rise of autocratic leaders around the globe, not in small countries where they always be, if I may say so, but now in the major countries. And these leaders, they often have a mafia style of leadership uh, being uh, uh, dismissive of media, uh, less respectful of the of independent courts, certainly focusing on uh, diminishing women's rights to their own bodies, etc. Only in the last ten years, and we've seen the new threat that I mentioned with climate change which also has been more evident during the last 10 years. And the media, which sadly uh, more than uh, often is uh, some kind of presenting politics as entertainment, like political duels, and the discussion Lars mentioned between Trump and uh, Biden very recently, uh, not now. So it's like uh, Roman gladiators, and uh, it's sort of, um, uh, well, it, uh, it's not very helpful to the debate. So I will end up by saying that we really need to put our that together now and uh, to prevent a kind of risk for a perfect storm and uh, uh, go back to your uh, UN, go back to dialogue, go back to building trust between people. Thank you. Many thanks, Yad, for your presentation. I think this was a, what you gave us, what you offered us, was an incisive and lucid analysis of uh, various different aspects of human security. After this, we will turn to Copenhagen. Isn't it wonderful that we can have a discussion with participants sitting so far apart? Uh, the word is yours, Marie, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the word. And um, I am, uh, I am in, from the humanities, so I will, of course, uh, have an approach that centers very much on, on the human experience and the lived experience. So while I still talk about human security, it would be also about the sense of safety uh, and the focus on, on, on the lived experience. Uh, now, Yad talked about many different experiences of security. Uh, and I want to start about uh, with an example that is not about Japan. Most of what I will say will be about Japan, but but I have a different example uh, from, uh, from Egypt, in fact. And it was right after 9-11 where me and, and a friend went to Egypt and uh, the place was crawling with tourist police 
uh, because they they had issues with safety based on on what had just happened. Um, and they were wondering why is it that more tourists do not come since we look so well after you because of this massive presence of police and it was very difficult to explain to them that this massive presence of police in itself made us feel unsafe because we were concluding that it must be very dangerous if you have that much police around so there are very different uh, perceptions of what is safe and I, and I think this is also an indication of of, of, of how differently we treat this. And I think this can lead me on to, um, to the Japanese case where for, at least for Danish tastes, tastes, maybe not for Swedish, we can discuss that later perhaps, uh, but there seems to be quite a lot of surveillance. You have the police boxes, the coma uh, in, in uh, local areas, so you can always get in touch with the police, which is very nice. Uh, some will also feel that they are looked after perhaps too bit too much uh, uh, and there will be surveillance cameras in in many places uh, and it is something that we discuss a lot in Denmark and it is frowned upon around here but I think there are also some examples of, of why it is that that, uh, that in the Japanese uh, environment this actually works very well and let me give you a specific example some years ago uh, a young girl was stabbed to death regrettably in, in a dark alley where there were no cameras uh, and, and I saw it on the TV in Japan within two hours police had managed to find um, surveillance camera footing of the perpetrators and they aired them on TV and uh, within three four hours they actually had their people. Now this helps create an, an an idea of safety in the public space, actually in spite of the murder being committed, there is a high risk of detection, there's a high risk of getting caught, uh, which in, on the other side uh, gives birth to larger tolerance towards surveillance. Uh, and, and I think this is a, a sign of one of the things about Japan that I cannot emphasize enough, the Japan be, be, believes in being prepared um, procedures are in place for all sorts of emergencies. Uh, you are supposed to obey these rules and procedures and it can be seen as extremely formalistic for people from other cultures such as my own, uh, but there actually is something to fear. There's plenty to fear in Japan. Uh, now just look at the Japanese geography for example. Uh, Japan is located on the so-called ring of fire which means that with no volcanoes, there would be no Japan. But it also means there are volcanoes in Japan. And it is not uncommon to hear that, for example, hikers get caught in poisonous gases from, from uh, volcanoes, which means that you're supposed to actually tell some authorities that you're entering this park so they know where to look for you. It also means you will have earthquakes. It means that you will have, uh, you will have, uh, on unstable ground. The climate Japan is located in means that it's prone to have typhoons, huge amounts of water causing flooding, causing landslides, causing wind damage. These are threats that we cannot do anything about. But if everyone knows what to do, losses can be minimized. So I suppose this creates the credo that says that so much is out of human control. So what we can control, we have to control. And it in turn creates a no tolerance for human error. And I have noticed that, that sometimes uh, my, my compatriots think that the Japanese are overly concerned with finding out who did wrong uh, and placing the blame, so to say. Uh, but I think this is also part of, of, of uh, enhancing the procedure. If you know what went wrong, you can make sure it does not go wrong again. There are, if you look at it, uh, huge plans for, for uh, what to do if an earthquake strikes. In Tokyo, for example, you can actually buy in bookshops maps that will help you locate uh, heart defibrillators, how you walk around the city, how you get home when the public transportation system has broken down. And I think this, this idea of preparing for something like this is quite alien to us and it must create a different idea of human safety. 
the Japanese, excuse me, the Japanese living in this situation, of course, will will uh, will have an idea of, of of the necessity of being prepared, and it means that there is a trade-off. Large product portions of the population are willing to accept surveillance and adhere to rules and perform disaster drills and so on. Uh, they trade certain personal freedoms for security based on an assessment about the possible risk, which is not unreasonable. So that is why I usually tell the Danes when they say, why are the Japanese putting up with this? I say, well, they have very different dangers to face. They have to do different things to feel secure. And if I may, I would like to end again on a personal note. Um, I suppose anyone who lived in Japan for a longer period knows that you have to sort your garbage. And, um, and unless you do it correct, you are very likely to get caught and called out and instructed in how to do it correct. Now, this is kind of a, a, an everyday uh, example that does not exactly or not immediately threaten my personal security. Yeah, but I was also once, when I lived there for a longer period, suddenly there was a knock on my door and the local policeman from the Korban came. And he had a formula I had to fill out uh, where it said, in case of disaster. And it's not really in case, it's when disaster strikes and you happen to be here. Uh, because it's not a question of if disaster strikes, it's a question when. And he wanted to know information about me, about my family, who would be my contact, who would they have to notify, uh, to tell people uh, what happened to me in, in case anything happened and I couldn't notify people myself. Uh, and I think this actually made me feel safe. Uh, this was uh, safety in a positive way, although it was also surveillance because this local policeman had seen me coming and going and probably also had notification from the city authorities that I was there. It wasn't my contact, it was his contact. But I think this kind of, 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 uh, of surveillance, if you will, was part of making me feel safe. And I think that this is also a very important aspect of human security, the idea that, that, that we all face different uncertainties, as Yad was also saying, and, and this has to be taken into account. Uh, and this can also sometimes explain that people are willing to make quite substantial trade-offs to achieve this sense of security. And I think that is it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yad. This was another wonderful presentation. I suppose we could say that um, human security has uh, an objective dimension. We can uh, try to define what it means. We can even try to spell out under what circumstances people are actually, to what extent people are actually secure or insecure. But at least as important is the subjective dimension of human security. How do real people actually perceive their uh, situation in terms of security and insecurity. And I think your presentation was eminently helpful in, 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 in drawing attention to some aspects of uh, Japan in this regard. So thank you so much. Finally, I will now uh, yield the floor to uh, uh, Dr. Paul Jonsson, please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much also for this uh, kind invitation and for putting on this hemp, uh, very good panel. Uh, I think it might be uh, unwise to invite a politician who doesn't really have a, the possibilities right now to draft a good opening statement. Uh, and uh, I will try to be brief in my introduction in remarks. As you notice uh, from the program, I speak in two capacities. I speak both as chairman on the Committee of Defense and as chairman of the Swedish-Japan uh, Parliamentary Friendship Group. Um, I should also add for for the protocol that this is uh, my last day as chairman of the Swedish Japanese parliamentary friendship group we're having our yearly meeting and I'm resigning uh, this afternoon after two years it's very difficult to combine two chairmanships in, in the Swedish Parliament uh, thank you also for three very good and structured uh, presentations and now prepare for something else I thought 
I could also mention that the Swedish Parliamentary Friendship Group is actually the biggest friendship group in the Swedish Parliament. It's also the oldest. We have well over 50 members of Parliament who have joined this friendship group. And I think that says something about the soft power and the appeal of Japan and Japanese uh, culture in the Swedish society in general and in the Swedish Parliament in particular. I thought that it probably is most helpful if I speak from the perspective of uh, practitioners, uh, since this is what I, what I do on a daily basis. And I'll talk a little bit about the concept of security and how much it has changed during the last five years, to my mind. Um, uh, of course, I talk from a Swedish or European perspective, and uh, all of you know that the European security architecture is quite different from the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, security architecture that Japan is, uh, is operating under, but I think there are some common features that uh, both makes us stay, uh, stay awake at night, which uh, affect us. And I thought I'll do it from a here and now perspective on, on to my mind, how much the work in the uh, Committee on Defense has changed during the last few years. Those of you who are familiar with the Swedish Parliament and the Committee of Defense know that we predominantly work with something we call in Swedish Kuler och Krut, i.e. that is uh, budgetary issues and uh, defense acquisition programs and management. And that's tra traditionally how much we tended to, to operate and have a focus. So the perspective had been a state-centered perspective on military security. During the last few years, this perspective has changed quite a lot. And just as uh, pointing out some empirical examples of that is that we are, as of now, or at least in 30 minutes, we're going to be this, uh, debating in, in the Swedish chamber the, about the foreign direct uh, investment into critical infrastructure. I think this is a dimension of security that, uh, that uh, and this bill also we drafted in the Committee of Defense, this is aspect of foreign direct investment into critical infrastructure. This is a dimension that we did not grapple or or, uh, or debated a few years but it's now an intrinsic element of our security that we have to think about these things uh, on the agenda tomorrow when we when we uh, are discussing the, uh, the items on uh, in the committee of, of defense uh, our first topic is cyber security this is uh, something that we work a lot with the different government agencies on establishing. Uh, after that, we have a special sec section on cyber defense, uh, especially the Swedish Armed Forces and our signal intelligence agencies is, are going to be discussing what measures we're taking that. We have another bill tomorrow that we're going to uh, work on, and that is civil emergencies and the Swedish Rescue Service. I think there is uh, an awareness that uh, due to climate change, these kinds of large scale forest fires that we've been exposed to during the last few years, it is going to be something that's going to re-emerge uh, continuously. Uh, during the whole spring, we've been discussing the pandemic and what uh, what kind of implications that uh, COVID-19 has for our security. Then our main focus has, of course, been on the Swedish Arms Forces support to, uh, to the civil society. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, to my mind, the pandemic, there is an awareness uh, that it brought about that even unexpected events can happen. And uh, uh, also, I think, my main point is here that uh, we are handling a much wider scope of security issues or a multi-dimensional threat spectrum that we weren't so concerned with for a few years ago. And I think this, uh, the bottom line here is that we need to, that many of these new security challenges, which I, I discussed a little bit about uh, climate change, about uh, the need for cybersecurity, foreign direct investments into critical infrastructure, all of those issues, that they are issues that you can't really deter by military means. Uh, what you need to focus on is to mitigate your vulnerabilities and enhance your resilience against these kinds of threats. So we have this, this challenge as of now that we have a threat spectrum which entails many, many more components than we used to grapple with five, ten years. At the same time, I think this goes both for the European security environment and also to a certain degree also on the East Asian security environment is, of course, the risk for kinetic threats and military threats unfortunately has also increased. 
So we are uh, exposed to both traditional military old threats and at the same time we have to handle the scope of the gray zone between, between, uh, new, uh, between uh, what you call sometimes uh, hybrid threats. So these are kind of the challenges that we are, are living with here and now in, as uh, practitioners that we have this multidimensional threat challenge that we were exposed to. Uh, something we haven't really talked to, but as a practitioners, we, we always have to come up with, with uh, responses to events in the world, which I think are, are challenging. And of course, on the global basis, which is of major concern to us right now, is that, that uh, we are seeing increased uh, competition between great powers. And we talk about uh, a G2 world. And uh, I think also, we need to discuss a little bit on how human security can actually contribute to handling this aspect of security as well. I think we're, there is a certain risk that we're heading to what we call a technology war. So this is also some of the things that uh, I think we, we need to discuss and grapple with. I find that human security is, is something that is helpful and I think it's something that enhances security on the general level, um, I think we might want to strive avoiding too much of zero-sum games between different aspects of national security, of course, with military security being one component. We talk a lot about civil emergencies, civil uh, civil defense and, and those aspects. And then you also have the, um, have the human security aspects as well. And I think it's a helpful uh, concept for us to widen the perspective of, of security and what measures can actually enhance that. But I'll, I'll stop there as a way of introduction and I'll be glad to, uh, to uh, take any questions that might emerge. Uh, and sorry for being slightly um, uh, incoherent here. It's uh, been uh, quite an intensive time during the last uh, 24 hours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I don't think you were uh, the least incoherent. Uh, on the contrary, I think this was a very interesting uh, presentation that provided us with a practitioner's perspective, which is uh, highly meaningful. And for me personally, it was especially interesting to be reminded that also from a practitioner's point of view, the very perception of the very notion of security is, has changed quite a lot. During the and is changing, I suppose. It's really a challenge for all of, us, all of us to to keep up with these changes that are caused by technological advance and globalization and a lot of various factors, I suppose. Uh, now, is, uh, I would like to thank all four panelists for excellent presentations. And, and the time has come to open the floor for questions and answers. I hope you know how to, to, to do this. I will open myself. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Yukaku Uemura in Japan, I suppose, uh, wishes to say thank you all for your inspiring, insightful presentations. And again, as a moderator, I very much agree. Do we have any questions? Uh, the same uh, Mr. Uemura uh, uh, says, I would like to ask Marie if you see any cultural aspects in the handling of COVID-19 situation in Japan? Hmm. Well, certainly there are some cultural or historical aspects. Uh, for example, we've had a big fight about wearing face masks around here and, and also in, in the United States and so on. And, and uh, I think that was much less of a problem in Japan because uh, the Japanese have been using them for years and years. And I went on radio to say that, you know, when there was a very critical point in the Danish discussion and said that, that 120 million Japanese cannot be wrong about this. So, so, uh, so in that sense, you can call it culture, you can call it a, a, a historically based practice, but, but, but that certainly, uh, there was a much more readiness, I think, in, in the Japanese population to accept official instruction Culture, I don't know, but it's what you're used to if you live in a society that is also under constant threats, uh, uh, 
from natural disaster, for example, it's very important that you're actually able to, to, uh, to listen to what authorities instruct you to do. Uh, and, and I think the Japanese have learned that the hard way, that unless you all do what you're supposed to do and play your role, even if you do not completely understand why, things can go horribly wrong. Mm. So I think in that sense, there was a very different way of handling it in, in, in Japan. And I have to hand it to you that right now in, in, the, in Denmark, we have infection rates, the same number as in Japan, and, and we are only 5 million people. Uh, but we have 5 million people that are as easy to train as cats. So <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. Uh, and and, and I, I don't know if it's, culture, or if it's just that, that, you know, in Japan, you have a very acute sense of the necessity of this. I'm not saying that the Japanese are culturally disposed to being more obedient or, or, or whatever other things that, that people sometimes say. I don't think that's the case. I think the case is that, that you have realized that there's a very real risk and you have, you have to relate to that. So that is why things like this can, can work more easily in Japan than perhaps in, in a place like Denmark where we usually have very little threats and, and mostly from ourselves. Thank you, Marie. We have received a question from uh, Mr. Uno Svedin, who writes like this. We have now heard about the seven categories, I suppose, of human security. Are there still other dimensions lurking behind the corner? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, yep. Uh, I think that we have to be aware of that type of uh, human security is quite Floating thing, and we're trying to grasp it. I understand that Paul has a uh, doctoral thesis on the subject, so I'm sure he has interesting comments on that. Uh, the UN, the PM, some, but I think there is one dimension which we haven't really discussed yet so much, and it's uh, economic tensions. Uh, we have seen. Uh, the economic financial crisis in 2008, we have seen a growing economic divide between different groups. And again, I build on this magazine, Dagens Industri, which uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday had a very interesting article on how the richest percent in the United States uh, who now controls already vast uh, resources, they are the ones who gain more than certainly the poor groups. And that, of course, is something that can increase tension. We have also a moral dimension, I would say, of human security. We have it in the discussion of how to replace the high court judge Ruth uh, uh, Ginsburg, um, and uh, who could now be replaced with a Catholic anti abortion person. So we have this moral dimension of politics, and it's also concerning human security, I would say. Did launch Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. No, <laughs> no. Uh, just think if I could. That, uh, uh, place the ball in fourth quarter of the and I think that today we see less of a risk for a conflict uh, between the states and more a conflict within the states. We know that uh, voters preferring Trump don't even talk to family members who uh, support Biden. We have different divides in countries like Hungary and Poland. I think the risk for internal strife, internal uh, <coughs> even uh, conflicts where people use arms to defend their positions within states, that's a growing risk, which I guess can even exceed the risk of conflict between states. Thank you. Uh, Lars, did you want yeah. to comment on this question? Yes. Um, I was very much in agreement with, I am very much in agreement with um, what Marie is saying um, about the community in Japan and so forth. Uh, there is a, an, an, a legend, I suppose, uh, or, or at least a, a story about what happened in the, in the old times in Japan, 
there was a village uh, uh, situated very high up in the mountains and uh, the villagers were going down to the beach uh, to pick up uh, whatever they could, uh, oysters and things like that. And most of the uh, village, or all of the villagers really, uh, went down to the beach. Uh, only the village head stayed uh, in the village because he was too old. But once all the villagers were down there, uh, he could see uh, in the distance that there was a tsunami uh, approaching. And uh, there was no way that he could uh, shout. There was no way that he could wave with anything that wouldn't really uh, call their attentions. So what did he do? He put fire to his own house. And then when the villagers saw um, the, the flames of the, the village head, they all rushed up to, to, um, to put out the fire. And in that way, he rescued everyone. This kind of a community spirit is something that is under threat, I think. It is, uh, there's always um, a necessity to sacrifice something in order to gain something. And I think that um, we're sacrificing uh, the community spirit in our in local societies, but I'm not sure what we're gaining. So this is some, this is really a dilemma that, that we have to replace uh, this community spirit with something viable, uh, in my opinion. There's another story, more of a joke, uh, when it comes to Korban, the, the police uh, boxes uh, in Japan. And that is um, a foreigner coming to the Korban and the police and says, um, could you please tell me, do you perhaps know where Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Suzuki lives? Oh, sure, he's, the police says. You go down that street, um, three blocks, and then, then, then two blocks to the left, and there's a red house there. Uh, that's their house. Oh, thank you very much. But th there's no, no use in going there because they're not at home. Okay. So the, the, the complete control uh, of, of the community is, is uh, something. And there's a trust, of course, because between the people living there and the police. But then there's the risk also of trusting too much uh, that everything is functioning. And we saw that in 1995 when you had the Serene attack, uh, Sarin attack at, in the uh, uh, subway system in Tokyo. There, uh, under the um, umbrella of freedom of religion, uh, the police did not uh, really go into the camps of, of the uh, Om Shindikyo. And uh, thereby they could develop uh, biological weapons and, and even uh, machine guns and, 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 and so forth, and, and be became a real threat to the Japanese society. So there's also a risk of, of trusting the system too much. There must be some, some way of, of, of reminding everybody that, that uh, we have to look at, are we efficient? Are we, are we doing the right things? This is something that we're missing. And recently in Sweden, there has been news and, and debate about uh, so-called communities within the communities that we are not uh, discovering, and they are connected with uh, organized criminals, that, that we're not, we don't know what they're doing. And uh, in the end, and we don't control them, in the end, they pose as, as big threats. So those, those kind of things, I think, are, are necessary. The community spirit has to be somehow um, return somehow or save somehow and then we cannot trust our systems too much we have to make sure that there are controlled functions in them thank you thank you very much and paul also wanted to add mm -hmm. comments absolutely uh well i'm i'm certainly as concerned as anyone else about the backlash of democracy according to freedom house i think we had a backlash in 13 years in a row we have a serious concerns with democracy as far as goes in hungary as you know we started uh, this uh, chapter 7 uh, review of hungary uh, we have concerns in poland we see developments in turkey which also are a concern uh, so i think what we are seeing actually quite a big backlash for, for the whole international liberal order. And this has been an order that has served 
Europe and Sweden rather well, I must say. Uh, you have strong international institutions uh, respecting the territory and sovereignty of other countries, uh, norms and values. Uh, I do claim that the European security order is being challenged uh, by Russia. Uh, Russia, it's an undisputable fact that Russia invaded and occupied two countries within the within the time frame of, of 10 years, 2008, of course, in Georgia and 2014 in Ukraine. Uh, so I think we see a heightened tension for a European security environment and Russia do, is not the status quo power in, in Europe, which is a concern. Uh, in East Asia, this is a region, of course, I don't know nearly as well as, as many of you others, but uh, I, I think that the bilateral relationship between the United States and China has been filled with a lot of tensions. I think there is a drastically changing balance of power that uh, may both in military terms, in economic terms and, and in political terms that is rapidly changing and we know the a fastidious trap always that is a risk. So I think that's what I alluded to before when I said that, that there is an increased uh, great power competition and that this also has uh, ramifications for military security. Um, and then you can debate if it's wrong or, or right. Uh, the, the way that Sweden is going, of course, in investing more into its armed forces and, and also in other regions. But I think it's uh, the it's undisputable fact that tension among great powers are increasing and and this is uh, something that has uh, ramifications also in the realm of military security. Thank you. Uh, now I will read a question posed by Mr. Jacob Ranglin Grisler. He writes as follows, Japan's justice system has sometimes been criticized by human rights organizations for having a high conviction rate based on confession before trial is undertaken. This has sometimes led to forced confessions and in extreme cases, innocent people being found guilty. Still, this has also led to a high rate of criminals being sentenced. Could this be explained by Japan's higher demands on security measures that Marie mentioned and how would this be considered in terms of human security? Shall we turn the question to Marie then to begin with? Yes, I, I will just start and, and, and then let the uh, experts on, on, uh, on uh, human security business uh, uh, talk about that. But, but uh, of course, this is a problem. And I, I think it ties into what Lars said, that do not trust your systems too much <laughs> because, uh, because this system uh, of, of, of public security uh, can also cons consist of a trap, which means the police simply has to find whoever did it. Uh, and, and, and if they think they, they, have, uh, they have circumstantial evidence uh, enough of it, then they will uh, prefer the confession before, uh, before going to trial, because that is sort of considered the harmonious way of doing it. Uh, so, 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 uh, and and uh, uh, somebody who's arrested will also be hugely encouraged to to to, of course, confess. Uh, so, so there are stories about this, and of course, it, as in in Japan, they do have the death penalty. I think this uh, puts puts a very uh, serious burden on the shoulders of, of those conducting the investigations. Uh, and 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 there are examples now of DNA testing showing that they did, in fact, in some cases, have the wrong people. So there is a growing awareness, but I think it would be extremely difficult to, to stop this because it's one of the ways of making the population feel secure and safe because the police will take it away the bad guys or girls or whoever did it. <laughs> uh, and, and I think this, this, is, this is crucial to what is happening. Uh, how it turns, how it ties in with human security other than that, that this, this might be a, a trap you can fall into when you want to really give the public security. I, I, I'm not the right person to talk about. So I hope one of, of the other panelists will, will elaborate on this. Does anyone want to link up with what Marie just said? Yeah, Lars, please. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's, it's a difficult issue, really. Um, the, the, by having harsh methods, uh, you create a certain form of, of security, but of course, this shouldn't be um, allowed if, if it goes uh, uh, against uh, law, laws and, 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 and behavior. I have a feeling that it's true that, that the, the interrogation, interrogations can be quite um, 
uh, harsh. Uh, we have seen also at least reports that have have been uh, uh, the, the authorities have said that this is not the case. But in the arrest of, of uh, Carlos Gorn, he said that he was treated uh, very uh, harshly. But then again, as Marie said, there's a uh, support from the the Japanese people for these methods because they feel that um, uh, it 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 give, produces results. But of course, if someone is innocent, it's a tragic uh, thing that they are are sentenced to a long uh, uh, prison terms. But one should also turn it the other way around. Uh, how do you make sure that that uh, guilty people are not uh, uh, escaping sentences. So I think this is the Japanese perspective that we, we don't want uh, the, the guilty ones to, to escape. Uh, we want to make sure that we are, are, are catching them. But of course, I think there's a balance there. Um, of course, uh, the police in any country should be, uh, have or follow democratic principles, definitely, and, and uh, human rights and so forth. But then I trust the Japanese society and the Japanese democracy that they will discuss these issues uh, themselves and, and solve it in the way, in a democratic fa fashion. Thank you very much. We have 20 more minutes to go and two more questions. And then finally, I very much hope that we will be able to give each panelist a couple of minutes to round up the discussion. <laughs> have you met, is there, are there any more comments about question that Maria and Lars just addressed? If not, I will turn to a question posed by Kazuhiko Kawasaki, a familiar name, hello Kazuhiko, who writes as follows. Pandemics have changed our world so much this year. As Lars mentioned, presidential debates today in the US remind us that we can no longer rely on the US leadership. What kind of leadership can and should Japan play in the post-corona era, preferably together with Europe and Sweden? Question to Lars and Paul from Kazuhiki Kawasaki. Go ahead, Lars, will you start? Okay. Um, well, I think that the Japan can, can uh, be the good example, uh, but uh, it's not enough to be a good example of, of doing things right uh, by tackling problems and solving problems in the right way. You also have to take the lead. I, I have a feeling that Japan has difficulties in acting as the, the, the team leader. They, they did, uh, well, Japan did act as a team leader when it came to saving the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the, the TPP uh, trade agreement and, and expand it. But I think for Japan to be able to show itself as a good example, <clears throat> it has to team up with other good guys, so to speak. And, and therefore I think the, the solution is to really that, that uh, like-minded countries, and I count Sweden as one of them, uh, can team up with, with Japan and uh, form a, a, a force, so to speak, uh, in order to push for certain solutions, to push for certain um, discussions, and, and, and also by um, uh, maintaining or keeping transparency while they're doing so. It's very hard to, to fight uh, evil forces because they, they are evil. <laughs> but, but there's no other alternative than, than having the good forces uh, get together and, and form as, as strong alliance as possible. And I think Japan in many ways is the perfect alliance to Sweden at least. Alliance partner, sorry. <clears throat> Should I go on? Yes. Yeah, uh, well, I think it's a little bit too early to tell yet what uh, major geopolitical and geoeconomic consequences the pandemic will have. Uh, I think we will see it in a, in a few years try time if it's been a game changer or if it's going to be reinforcing a lot of those trends that we've been seeing uh, during uh, the last few years. Uh, one trend 
so far that seems fairly evident i think is that uh, there uh, with the exception probably of bolsonaro there is a backlash for nationalist populism uh, at this stage uh, i see it on the domestic political landscape that economic policies and so forth are becoming more important and and this wave of of national uh, populism that's been striking europe and and uh, the united states and uh, other continents as well that seems to to have stopped uh, with, with this pandemic, which to my mind is uh, also a little bit encouraging. What role can Europe and, uh, and Japan play? Well, we have, of course, we have a new bilateral agreement between uh, the EU and, and uh, which in part is a trade, trade agreement, but there is also a political dimension of, of enhancing relations between Europe and, and Japan. I find this encouraging and I find it increasingly important as two entities that have a strong faith in uh, rule of law and in, in democracy and so forth. So I think I think there also is a special sections actually where we're going to be having working groups on things like hybrid threats. And uh, I talk a lot about enhancing our society's resilience. Um, and I think uh, measures like that where we can cooperate uh, based on our both our common uh, uh, interests, but also even more on our common values uh, can be helpful. So an intensified political dialogue between Europe and Japan is something that I would uh, strongly uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have uh, two more questions, and I think these will have to be the final two questions after the, these. Uh, the panelists will have a chance to speak for a couple of minutes. Uh, the next question has been posed by Nina Lundqvist, who writes as follows. Do you think there are conflicts or trade-offs between those seven elements of human security? For instance, when people are used to follow restrictions and instructions for safety, the other aspects of human security, such as community and political security, can be threatened? Question mark. If so, is there any hierarchy among those elements? Could you explain any tendency and characteristics on how this kind of dilemma is solved in Japan and in Sweden? Not an easy question, I suppose. Who, who would like to start? Could you not hear me? Yeah, yes, I, I, I could. Uh, maybe I can just say a few words. I, it, it's very difficult to, to um, rank the different aspects, and I think they should be um, ranked uh, equally important, although uh, they might not be equally important. But my, my point earlier was that you, if you don't have the whole package, there's something missing and, and you need to, to make sure that all the aspects are, are treated in, in, in the right way. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the best way simply is to make sure that, that um, uh, there's a transparency and that there's a, a control mechanism somehow in your society or in your democracy that easily and, and quickly points out that there's something lacking here. And I think uh, in, in, in Sweden, for instance, I think there's no, there's, we don't have to be, we don't have to worry that, that people are not pointing out uh, difficulties and what they think are, are wrong faults with our system. Uh, they do that quite frequently. And, th and this is something that I think is, is, is necessary. But of course, I think if one should sum up and or somehow put all the aspects into one, one word, uh, it's probably um, dignity, human dignity. You have to have human dignity, I mean, among themselves, among each uh, human being, um, or among human beings, sorry, how uh, people respect each other, how they uh, think about each other, how they communicate, uh, for the purpose of having a common good, and I think this is easily said, and very difficult. It's very easy to say and, and difficult to realize, of course. But perhaps without that spirit, it's hard to look at all the other aspects. <clears throat> Thank you. And the question. Did Jed want to say no? No. I... Okay. The final question comes from Dietrich Albert. Uh, and there may be a misprint here, I'm not sure. In Japan, many threads cannot be controlled. Does Yakuza 
belong to that category. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure the, I understand the question, but but of course, the the in a way you can say that the yakuza is is living in their own bubble, so to speak. But uh, I think they are, to a certain extent, controlled. I think the police knows um, how many they are and, and what they're doing, um, trying to um, put, set up borders for, for that they cannot cross uh, and, and not threaten uh, people uh, that shouldn't be threatened and so forth. But it's very hard. It's a difficult question. I, I can't really answer it. Okay, so at, at this stage, I think we are really approaching the end of a very lively and, and fascinating discussion, at least from the point of view of the moderator. Uh, shall we conclude by, by giving uh, the remaining three panelists a couple of minutes each to round up the discussion? Unfortunately, as you all of you have noticed, Marie had to leave early for family reasons. I suggest that we, we call on the panelists to make some uh, remark, their remarks in, the, uh, in a reverse order as compared to the introductory, introductory remarks. So let us first call on Paul to him and ask you, would you like to say something in conclusion? Uh, just a few more words about uh, the concept of human security. Uh, uh, in all honesty, it's not on top as a concept as developed uh, among us who are policymakers and practitioners. I think there are several important and helpful elements of it that I take also from this discussion and, and from from previous reading that I've been doing as well. I think that the, the connection between security and development uh, is such things that we need to take seriously into mind. Uh, the interlink, of course, between if people have development, uh, economic development, it in general enhances the security. I think that the concept of climate change and how that can drive uh, conflicts due to from an individual human security perspective how it changes people's life i think that is something that is uh, is important and fruitful i think that you can put the human security perspective also on the pandemic this also if you it's a non man made uh, natural disaster that is striking across the whole globe and i think it changes our, our views and outlook on on uh, on how we can obtain security uh, as a point of reference i want to say that the initial european reaction or the eu reaction on on the pandemic was not our finest moment. Of course, the national, it was an immediate uh, reflex to, to re-nationalize, re uh, have your own security supplies and close borders. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think we, I think we were quite ill-prepared uh, for for the, the kind of major ramifications that the pandemic has had. And I think there, as I said, there is a human security dimension to it. I think also it's in one way or another, if you want to appeal to policymakers also to provide answers for some of the things that we are grappling with right now. I tried to to the, put a little bit on light on how we think in terms of military security and some of the causes of concerns that, that we have about high tensions between great powers and on a regional basis, what's happening in the south, uh, in the Sea of Japan, or or uh, what's happening in in the Baltic Sea, and something. This is something that keeps us at wake at night. We are also kept at wake at night about this growing that gap between digitalization and cybersecurity. This is something that can have major implications. We are concerned, as I said, sometimes if we don't have legislations on foreign direct in, uh, investments, uh, we are concerned also with the, with the disinformation operations that is directed from uh, predominantly illiberal countries towards to our societies. Uh, and I think human security in as far mm -hmm. as, as it connects to, as I said, mitigating risks and enhancing the resilience of all kinds of societies is, is a helpful concept. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. And now it's uh, Yaj's turn, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's been very interesting to take part in this uh, dialogue. It's been giving a lot of new insights and perspectives. I would like to <clears throat> finish off with three points. I think that the last decade 
has demonstrated an increase in threats on human security. We've had the old ones um, with the military conflict, with poverty, with lack of respect for rule of law and human rights. In addition, now we have climate change, we have social media who could both improve our living conditions and uh, qualities of life, but which tend to be used as a threat to the fundamentals of democratic uh, systems and institutions. And uh, I think that we are used to see 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall as a sign that the liberal uh, world won. But I fear that at this time in the history, it seems like uh, the more mafia style than it is Putin has the upper hand. Not really in terms of posing a military threat, but posing a threat to the fundamentals of the democratic system. So my recommendation is, as a former diplomat, that we must go back to dialogue, we must go back to diplomacy, we must use that line of defense. And part of that line of defense is connected to what I do at this very moment. I defend free media, I think. Uh, great journalists like Anne Applebaum and uh, Marsha Gerson and a number of others, they are crucial to defending the, uh, the human uh, security that now needs strongly to be defended. And with it, climate change is coming up. And the final intervention will be uh, Lars. Mm, well, thank you. Um, I, I think the, the, the main point that I would like to make is that, that um, it's simply to point out that we have lost something that we have to uh, try to catch or, or, or regain. And that is the, um, as I mentioned before, the, the community spirit. I remember, spirit, I remember when I was uh, around 10 years old or so, I went into a, a shop uh, where you could buy uh, uh, milk and, and, and buns and so forth. And I used, um, I don't know why, but, but I used a, a swear word uh, or, or an abuse uh, as I exited um, the, the store. And later, uh, the, I, the store owner called my parents and <laughs> I had to, uh, together with my parents, I had to go back. Had to go back to the store and apologize, which, of course, I was forced to do. So I did it. Uh, I don't think that that can happen today. <laughs> I, I don't think the, the the abuse has become the 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 daily um, food for, for for our actions somehow. And so I think the the one somehow has to turn back the clock without becoming uh, someone who, who, who strives to, to uh, go against uh, progressions or, or go against um, good things that we have developed. And, and I think that the, the solution to that is really that we have to think about these things that, as I mentioned in the beginning, that the pres presidential debate really underlines that we need freedom of hate, freedom of derogatory statements, freedom of, of lies. And I think the, the, the only way to do that is to go back all the way to preschool and, and, and somehow make sure that parents take the responsibility and, and we talk and there's a good dialogue between different generations and that we have some principles that we follow and that we don't only let everything happen if you look at the what what's uh, sometimes I, as everyone I, I flip the different channels on television and in one channel it's the murder in midsummer, the other it is the the mass massacre of this and and as entertainment, and I think that one step would really try to scrutinize oneself and say do I really want to be entertained by violence, uh, and one one very Strong example, I think, is in the movie 
uh, uh, go, um, the Godfather, there's a scene mm -hmm. where Al Pacino goes into a restaurant and there's a hidden uh, pistol uh, in the toilet. He goes to the toilet, he picks up the, the, uh, the pistol and then he shoots the other two that at the table. This, as entertainment, is powerful, but it's also very dangerous to... to uh, Toby, and I think you can run that I think we've lost Lars. Unfortunately, his connection is gone. Oh, I see. Well, anyway, we had, <laughs> I was busy listening to Lars making these interesting remarks, but we have come to the end of this uh, webinar, which at least for me has been exceedingly interesting. It has provided so many insights into the broad and multi-dimensional field of uh, human security. It has certainly uh, answered uh, some questions, but it has raised even more questions. It has stimulated our interest in this field. So I think we, at least I and I, I believe I can speak on behalf of the attendees. Uh, we are much looking forward now to the continuation of this project that law has launched. There will be a seminar, another webinar towards the end of October, hopefully dealing with with um, uh, human security in uh, different East Asian countries. And there will be a, a third uh, webinar with a sum up character uh, towards the end of the year. And beyond that, at least I hope that Lars will wish to continue uh, the, uh, our activities in this very important field. Uh, just to, to finish, let me, me uh, express um, our on behalf of the ISDP, thank our panelists for your excellent, really, truly excellent and stimulating contributions. And also uh, thank the audience, the attendees, for your interest and, and um, for your questions. See you next time. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.